Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, Earth Science Chapter 11 Living Resources Unit. Uh, today's podcast, we'll be talking about living resources. Uh, your first graphic, as you're looking at it right now, shows you a couple of different plants. Uh, one is a tree, and one is kind of a cactus looking gourd item. And if you look at those two things, you can probably figure out what kind of ecosystem they each come from. Take a second and look at it. Maybe, maybe if we take a look at the cactus, uh, we see by its size that it's probably storing something and that something that it probably is storing is water. That probably tells us from its environment that it doesn't have a lot of water or the water doesn't come on a regular basis. So it is adapted to store water. Now, the trees you see to the right don't look as adapted to store water. They look adapted to use a lot of sunshine. So that tells us that the ecosystem those trees are from probably has a, an abundant amount of rain and an abundant amount of sunshine uh, to, for those leaves to use. This unit's big idea is what defines the ecological roles and adaptations of organisms found in different biomes. What that's asking and what we want to be able to understand by the end of this unit is what is the driving force that causes organisms to adapt? What is the thing that causes the organisms to change to better fit their environment? The ocean is a home to a number of different types of ecosystems. Factors such as water temperature and the amount of sunlight determine what types of organisms can live in each zone. In the deep ocean zone, uh, very little light penetrates. So the types of organisms that live down there are typically decomposers uh, who will eat and survive off of the remains of dead and dying organisms that sink to the bottom. The open ocean zone has a multitude of different types of organisms, uh, usually larger scale organisms like whales and dolphins. As you get into the neuritic and the intertidal zone, uh, the amount of sunlight is quite high, so the diversity of life and organisms in those areas flourishes. By looking at this graphic, you can see the different zones uh, that exist in the ocean and the wide variety and diversity of life that exists in each of those zones. The ocean food web is as diverse and complicated as the life that lives in the ocean. This ocean food web includes typical organisms found in the Arctic Ocean. The arrows indicate what organism each eats. Now, if you, if you take a look here, you can find one organism, one common organism, that is the beginning of the food chain. Or, in other words, it is the organism that takes the energy from the sun and brings it into this ecosystem. Look carefully for a couple of seconds and see if you can determine what organism that is. If you said it's the algae plankton, you would be correct. The algae plankton has chlorophyll, which makes it green. Through photosynthesis, it absorbs heat from the sun and creates simple sugars. Those simple sugars are eaten <clears throat> by the animal plankton, which, as you can see by the arrows, several other organisms eat. All of the organisms in this ecosystem are dependent upon the algae plankton to start this ocean food web or to be the basis of this food web. Pause the video here to take the Section 2 quiz. You can go back and look at the video anytime you need to. Section 3 follows. This next graphic uh, involves talking about one of our most important resources, our forests, and how we can manage those as a resource that can be used both for economic and industrial requirements, as well as uh, for, the, for ecosystem balance and for enjoying them through recreational means. There are two types of cutting down trees. Clear cutting involves cutting down all the trees in an area at one time. Selective cutting involves cutting down only some trees. The advantage to clear cutting is it's inexpensive and a very efficient method of using the resource, uh, the wood from the forest. A much better choice, however, is what's called selective cutting in that only part of the trees are taken out of the forest. This does two things. One is it, as it grows back, it has a much more natural appearance. And secondly, and more importantly, it doesn't destroy an entire ecosystem. 
there is a multitude of organisms that use this, these forest trees uh, for the basis of their ecosystem, both for food and for shelter. Clear cutting of an area destroys the entire ecosystem. While selective cutting does damage the ecosystem, it doesn't destroy it. And since there are many trees left behind, it allows the ecosystem to restore itself at a much faster pace than an area that has been clear cut. Pause the video to take quiz three. You can go back and look at the video as you need to. Section four follows. More than 1.5 million species of organisms have been identified so far on this planet. People value wildlife and ecosystems for their beauty and as a source of recreation. In addition, biodiversity has both economic value and ecological value within an ecosystem. By looking at the graphic, you can see here by far the insects have the highest number of species on the planet at 950,000. Bacteria have 4,000 4, identified species and fu fungi has 72,000. Protists, or single-celled organisms, have approximately 80,000 species identified. Plants have 270,000, and all other animals have 255,000 species identified. Factors that affect a biodiversity in an ecosystem include the area, the climate, and the diversity of niches. If you look at the Earth's land ecosystems, tropical rainforests only account for 7% of the actual acreage on the planet. Although the tropical rainforest has that 7% of the Earth's land area, they are home to more than 50% of the Earth's species. And looking to the Earth's ocean ecosystems, coral reefs account for only 1% of the Earth's saltwater areas. Although it only accounts for 1% of the area, they are the home to about 20% of the world's saltwater fish species. The important fact to notice here is that by affecting a fairly small area of the Earth's surface or of the Earth's ocean ecosystems, you can have a drastic effect on a huge number of species of organism. An example of one such species is that of the California peregrine falcon. The peregrine falcon is the world's fastest bird of prey. It was nearly extinct in the U.S. in 1970. The pesticide DDT was weakening the peregrine egg shells, so eggs rarely hatched. In 1972, the United States banned DDT. By looking at this graph, you can plot the peregrine falcon's recovery. In 1975, there were less than 10 mating pairs uh, that existed still on the face of the earth. Uh, with the U.S. work on eliminating the, the pesticide DDT, you can see the growth from 1995 up to 2,000. We're up right now at approximately the carrying capacity of the California niche for the peregrine falcon at 150 mating pairs where it's stabilized. The peregrine falcon is no longer an endangered species. Today this is considered an environmentalist major success story. Pause the video here to take the quiz for section 4. If you need to go back to look through the video, you can do so. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is uh, the end of today's podcast. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Again, if you need to go back over the podcast to, uh, to hear something again, please do so. And if you have any questions, please see me in class. Have a great day. And again, thanks for listening.